Chapter 11, Letters to Snooks. Army planes en route to the Southwest Pacific have joined the search for Captain E.V. Eddie Rickenbacker, War Department officials disclosed today, in the hope that the missing World War I ace might still be found. That was the news from Washington, D.C. on November 1st, the 12th day since the world had last heard from the B-17 crew. Unlike many newspaper editors, the U.S. military had not given up on the lost men. Planes headed for the battlefront in the Solomon Islands were to break formation and fan out to look for a stray raft on the waves below. To the flyers peering out the windows of their warplanes, finding Eddie Rickenbacker was probably not the foremost thing on their minds. They were headed back into some of the most brutal fighting of the war. Four of them had been trotted out to talk to reporters at Hickam Field just two days earlier. They had been on Guadalcanal, the tiny jungle island that figured heavily in Rick Rickenbacker's mission. Since October 12th, the Japanese had been trying desperately to win back the island's airstrip. It was the site of a life-and-death struggle, reported the New York Times. The outcome could decide the war in the Pacific for good. According to what the flyers told reporters, they had some things in common with the castaways on the rafts. They barely slept, thanks to relentless bombing runs by the Japanese. By 11 p.m. every night, they were up and running for their foxholes. The ground was shaking all the time like jelly, said one of the men. They were also hungry most of the time because Japanese warships surrounding the island made it hard for the Americans to land supplies. The men were stuck with two small meals a day, mostly rice left behind by the Japanese. On October 24th, about the time Rickenbacker had been scheduled to arrive in the area, the Marines held off a massive attack by the Japanese on the outskirts of the airstrip. The fighting left a line of Japanese corpses stretching for half a mile along the edge of the jungle. It also left the Americans with fewer than 30 planes to fend off the bombings. Japanese ships were still massing in the waters around Guadalcanal. It was obvious they were preparing to land another wave of troops. The Marines needed planes fast from bases in Hawaii and the mainland United States, and that meant for more pilots that more pilots were in the sky with orders to look for eight men that most Americans had already given up on. On the rafts, the men almost never mentioned the war. Rickenbacker was determined to get back and complete his mission, but he kept his thoughts to himself. The rest of the men had no idea what was happening in Guadalcanal or the Soviet Union or North Africa, nor did they care. The newspapers and the generals and the politicians claimed they were fighting for freedom and democracy. But in the rafts, the men found it hard to get excited about noble causes when they'd had six ounces of water to drink in two weeks. DeAngelis, for one, was bitter that he had to die of dehydration, all because some guys made up their minds to have a war. On the eight, of, the eight, of the eight raft mates, however, DeAngelis was not the one closest to death. When the sun rose on the twelfth day at sea, everyone was relieved to see that Alex's condition had improved. He seemed to know where he was and who his raft mates were. As the day wore on, though, he sank into a familiar state. His forehead felt hot as the sun. When he tried to talk, he made no sense. Alex rallied again as the air cooled, and that evening he asked to go back to the small raft. This time, DeAngelis traded places with Alex. Bartek took his fellow engineer into the donut and tried to get comfortable, but Alex would not sit still. He squirmed and draped himself over the side of the raft. Bartek quickly realized he was trying to end it all by giving himself up to the ocean. Bartek maneuvered Alex's legs under, under his and sat on them. When, he, when the wretched kid complained, Bartek let him squat on the floor of the raft. He spread his own legs out on the sidewall so Alex would have to climb over them to get out. At one point during the night, he had to grab Alex just before he slipped into the ocean. In the darkness, Bartek could hear his raft mate mumbling to no one in particular. For several days, Alex hadn't spoken much at all. Now he sounded more coherent than he had the entire trip. He prayed that he would see his mother, his sister, and his girlfriend, Snooks, again. Somewhere around two or three in the morning, he mumbled what sounded like a familiar prayer. Holy Mother Mary, Mary Mother of God, pray for us. He ended with an Amen. And then he stopped moving. Bartek knew what had happened, but but he willed himself to check. In the darkness, he found Alex's arm and felt for a pulse. Nothing. He leaned forward and put his hand over Alex's heart. Nothing. Twenty feet away, in the middle of 
In the middle raft, Rickenbacker woke up. He thought he heard a long sigh. Maybe Bartek had called to him, and he heard the words in a half-conscious state. Maybe he simply knew. Did he die? He called out across the waves. I think so, Bartek said. They pulled the rafts close. Rickenbacker, Cherry, and Whitaker examined Alex as well as they could in the dark. There was no question he was dead, but they agreed they should wait till the first light to do anything else. Well, someone said, his sufferings are over. They let the rafts drift, up, drift apart. The wind had come up strong and the sea churned around them. Rickenbacker had heard that sharks can sense death even before it arrives. He thought the fins around the rafts had already multiplied. The predators circled in the dark. Clouds raced across the sky in the moonlight. The familiar loneliness of night set in, and this time it was accompanied by fear. In the donut, Bartek began the long wait till morning with Alex's legs slowly stiffening in his lap. In Connecticut, Corrine Bond, known as Snooks to her boyfriend, had already woken up to a Monday morning. Before long, she would be checking her mailbox to find yet another letter postmarked Hawaii and signed by Alex Kay.